Thank you very much for joining us. I'm, I'm Peter Lowen. I'm one of the associate directors here at the Schwartz Wiesman Institute. Um, and I'm really pleased today to be hosting this seminar with John Lindsay, who's joining us uh, from Georgia Tech uh, in Atlanta. Though it uh, pains me to say not long ago, John would have been joining us from the Monk School. Um, he is uh, presently an associate professor um, at a few different places at, at Georgia Tech, um, principally at the School of Cybersecurity and Privacy, uh, but also at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs and by courtesy at the School of Public Policy. Um, I'll say a bit more about John, but that gives you a bit of a sense of the, the reach of the work that, um, that he does. Um, he's the author of a few different books. One is Information Technology and Military Power, um, and he's the author of a forthcoming book titled The Age of Deception, Cybersecurity, and secret statecraft. He is, for my money, one of the best people to listen to if you want to understand how um, technology and state interests are uh, intersecting to create and sometimes prevent conflict um, in the world today. So John, it's a real pleasure to have you with us um, today. I know you're going to give a talk titled Age of Deception, the Paradox of Cooperation of Cooperative Conflict in Cyberspace. Um, and I really look forward to it. John's let me know that he'll talk for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, welcomes clarifying questions and I'll keep um, an eye out for those um, in the chat or if you want to put up your hand. Um, and with that, there's nothing more to do except to say, John, I'm really pleased you're joining us. I know everyone online is and I'm going to turn it over to you and welcome you to the Schwartz Reisman Institute. Great. Um, thanks very much, Peter. And thanks to uh, SRI for the invitation to speak. Um, this is a, uh, a talk on uh, a book, which uh, I'm just in the, the throes of finishing right now. And it's a book that really did begin at the University of Toronto. So um, it's fantastic to be able to give a talk that, um, you know, kind of um, shows where, where, where I've come from and, and what I've been thinking of. Um, University of Toronto is an amazing place for thinking about technology and politics from uh, Marshall McLuhan back in the day to uh, Ron Debert um, present day. And I've been kind of influenced very much by that tradition. And I think you'll see this, um, you know, this is really an effort to try and think through the political philosophy of cybersecurity, um, bringing in you know, ancient sources and kind of thinking about what they mean for our modern predicament. So, uh, so that's where I'm trying to go with this. Um, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, you know, I've been looking at cybersecurity for a while, and there's been this stylized debate. It goes on today um, about whether uh, cyber war and cyber warfare are transforming the nature of politics. So really for the last three decades, we've been hearing warnings about digital Pearl Harbors or cyber 9-11s. Uh, and you know, it's amazing, every new generation of technology um, kind of recreates these uh, really frightening stories about how as we become more digitally interdependent and we connect together our infrastructure, uh, we should expect to see terrorists and rogue states and all kinds of different actors um, create, you know, large scale digital havoc. Um, but of course, we haven't seen that, you know, um, we've seen a lot of activity, um, a lot of our alarming activity, but it doesn't kind of rise to the hype. So, you know, this is an effort to right, kind of steer through uh, sort of the skilla of threat inflation and exaggeration and the charybdis of saying, well, if it's not cyber war, it doesn't matter. Clearly, it matters. Right. There are lots of people that are on the front lines of kind of major infections, major intrusions. Um, civil society is getting hammered by all kinds of different threat actors, uh, state and non-state alike. Uh, so something is going on. Uh, what is it? If not war, then what? Right. And how should we understand this? OK, um, so. Um, getting an empirical bead on cyber conflict is very difficult. Um, it is you know, part of a species of self-hiding phenomena. Uh, threat actors uh, want to kind of hide their tracks. They don't want to be found. Uh, stealth and anonymity are really the, the coin of the realm here. So, um, you know, we have several different data sets that have attempted to, you know, look at cyber conflict broadly. Um, and I won't go into them uh, in depth other than to sort of point at this graph, which is an absolute mess, right? And should show you that these different attempts to measure cyber conflict um, are probably measuring very different things, right? And this ranges from the, you know, DC. Hey, yeah, John, I'm just going to say I can't I can't see your screen. I'm not sure others can either. So oh, I'm going to stop you right now because you mentioned a confused that, graph and I want to be confused. That is a problem. Okay, uh, let us try this again. 
Okay. So are you, are you seeing Scylla and Charybdis here? We're seeing uh, what is cyber conflict, somewhere between panic and complacency. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, that was the first Describe slide. my moderating style, but go ahead, please. Wonderful, wonderful. That's William Pitt trying to sail the British ship of state to the haven of public uh, diplomacy, right? So um, cyberspace is also supposed to give us this haven, but we've got this problem, All right? So uh, let's definitely look at these graphs. I'm sorry, hopefully, can you see them now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so what you should see is that, you know, these graphs are very much non-correlated, right? Different efforts to try and, and look at, hey, what is going on in cyberspace? So there's an international relations data set looking at, you know, attacks attributed to one state on another. That's this one DCID. Uh, there's another one where kind of European scholars who were dissatisfied with this American dyadic set said, well, let's come up with another one. And that's the European repository of cyber incidents. Um, the American think tank CSIS, not the Canadian intelligence agency, right, has another uh, data set to you know, look at things going on. And then uh, there's another one that, that Ron Diebert and, and I and Leonard Moshmeyer put together uh, looking at um, reports on targeted threats to civil society and other actors, okay? Um, so you know, an important thing here is these are not necessarily data sets of cyber conflict. They are that to an extent, but they're really data sets of reporting on cyber conflict. So while we may be looking at an increase in the volume of cyber conflict activity, we're certainly looking at an increase in interest in this activity, okay? Um, so, you know, I've tried to kind of divided this into, you know, espionage, by which I mean, you know, attempts to steal information. Um, that can be for kind of criminal intellectual property. It can be national security espionage um, uh, and disruption, which ranges from really kind of low level denial of service events to kind of high level Stuxnet disruption of, um, of, uh, of infrastructure. Okay, um, so, you know, um, both of these are kind of trying to measure these different things. They're all over the place. We see kind of increasing interest. Um, and, 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 you know, when we try and measure this, right, it's sort of, you know, unsatisfying. So a lot of my research tends to try and look at individual cases, right, because I think we can get a little bit more traction on some of the dynamics. Um, but what we can do is instead of looking at this as a time series, we can kind of look at it um, in terms of intensity or severity. And uh, both the European data set and the North American DCIED uh, data set um, have these different measurements of severity. Um, and they're slightly different in the way that they score, but interestingly, they, you know, in kind of the, the, the rankings that they have, um, they both really tend to cluster at the low end. Um, so a couple of kind of generic trends pop out, even though we have super noisy sampling, we're missing a lot, we can say that we generally tend to see more espionage than disruption, okay? So most of the cyber threat activity is about stealing information rather than messing up computer functionality, okay? Um, and we see a lot more low intensity probes and espionage events rather than sophisticated disruptions and espionage. So, so this is kind of the, the backward story from the cyber war story where we should see a lot of high intensity disruption. Here we see mostly espionage, most of it low intensity. Um, and I kind of put these two little curves, I call them my hypothesized curves. Um, don't worry about the numbers when we're talking about the hypothesized stuff. Actually, the curves should be much higher. And I'm just trying to suggest that whatever the real activity is, most of it we're not seeing we're not measuring, we're not reporting because it's less significant or it's completely hidden. What we do see, right, is mostly espionage rather than disruption um, and mostly small scale rather than large scale. So, you know, sort of schematically, that's generally what the, the distribution of, of cyber conflict looks like, um, as noisy and as uncertain as it is. Okay, um, so if not war, what is it? Um, you know, another alternative to war is thinking about intelligence. Um, and uh, these two pictures here are kind of two sort of paradigmatic uh, Russian espionage um, episodes. Um, and the one on the left is Kim Philby, sort of a, a favorite of uh, intelligence scholars um, everywhere. 
And uh, Kim Philby is smiling at the camera here in 1955 because uh, Prime Minister Harold McMillan uh, has just uh, let him off and has exonerated him for being under suspicion for being a Soviet mole, which of course he is, right? But he has fooled everybody into thinking that he is not actually uh, that. Um, Philby is, you know, a, a fascinating character. He was recruited as a young, you know, idealistic college student by the KGB in uh, the 1930s. Uh, he then joins the British um, uh, Special Intelligence Service, MI6, uh, rises to a very high level. He's actually working as a counterintelligence officer, so he's got a great cover. He says, hey, I'm going to go meet with these Russian spies so that I can turn them. Well, in reality, he's meeting with his handler, right, so he can give up uh, SIS and CIA secrets. Um, very, very damaging uh, penetration in the early Cold War. Right. And he's able to do this because he, you know, he looks and acts and for all practical purposes is a part of this tight knit trusted uh, community. Right. I mean, he's part of kind of the wartime intelligence effort, even though the entire time he's handing over information to uh, the Soviets. Um, but, you know, his luck runs out. Part of the lead is that he's, he has got some exposure that he doesn't control. Right. The rest of his spy ring starts to become compromised. Guy Burgess, right, gets drunk, drags, drags about his uh, uh, exploits, right? So he starts to get attention. Um, uh, communications with, you know, Soviet agents in the field are broken in the Venona files. So all of that is exposed. So let's fast forward now to 2020. And what you're looking at is uh, um, some code from the core exploit that compromised the Solar Winds company and was used as a beachhead for uh, the Russians then to uh, uh, get access to over 18,000 companies. Um, and they then, um, you know, gained intrusion, uh, uh, gained access to um, you know, probably 100, 200 more different uh, organizations um, through this second stage operation. Um, and, uh, you know, this was this was a, a huge deal. And, and SolarWinds, right, is, is currently used as an example of kind of large scale espionage that could have been even worse, right? What if it wasn't just espionage? What if it was disruption? What if they weren't just um, trying to get access to 18,000 or 100 different organizations? What if they wanted to uh, disrupt what was going on? But from kind of a historical perspective, what's fascinating to me is that this particular exploit, right, the way it didn't work, but the way it worked was that the Russians got access to the developmental code base of solar winds, learned how it worked, right, and then far in advance put this little snippet of code in, right, which makes some checks and then it runs some malicious code, uh, you know, some some call back to um, uh, their servers, that the Russian handlers, if you will. Um, and this is very much like, you know, recruiting a young Philby to kind of become part of a trusted organization. Um, that trusted spy now gets certified access to the rest of the organization, right? There's the credentials where the SolarWinds company, like they've compiled this code, right? It gets a totally valid digital certificate, it becomes part of this, this, this um, utility called Orion. What does Orion do, right? It is trusted to upload security patches to SolarWinds uh, customers, right? So it is entrusted to improve security, but in fact, it is the vector for insecurity, right? Exact same intelligence organization, right? This is the KGB 50 years later, now the Russian SVR, okay? Uh, using different trade craft um, in, in a new way. All right. But the entire time, it depends on trusted access through common systems. It depends on the willing but unwitting cooperation of the victim organization. So in this sense, right, while the technical tradecraft radically differs, um, we're looking at a similar sort of exploitation of cooperation and trust in order to uh, get access to sensitive targets. All right. Um, so the headline, right? Intelligence now. Intelligence is classic, right? We've been spying on each other as a species for, you know, um, thousands, if not millions of years. OK, uh, but now the tradecraft is more digitized, right? You can do it at scale, right? Philby was face to face with his victims. Um, the 
Russian attackers and the solar winds, right, were able to gain access to um, thousands of potential victims and to do it at arm's length, right? And interestingly, right, this is an increasingly civilianized set of interactions, right? This isn't just a government agency getting into another government agency um, looking for state secrets, okay? This is, yes, a government intelligence agency, but going through a civilian firm. Why are we even talking about this? They penetrated a civilian counterintelligence agency, FireEye, Nandia today, right? Um, that was probably their biggest mistake, right? Like going up against um, a really sophisticated counterintelligence organization. Um, that's what sort of exposed the entire thing. Okay, um, just like Philby, there's kind of a, more of a counterintelligence operation, counter counterintelligence to find out what fire I knew. Um, but anyway, um, the players in the intelligence contest today are increasingly um, civilianized. Okay, so um, if this is a form of intelligence, what do we know? What does political theory um, know about intelligence? And the short answer is, well, actually not much, okay? Um, you know, back in the 80s, uh, Robert Jervis, who did pass recently and did a great deal to uh, advance not only the kind of theory of international relations, but to kind of, you know, get some attention to intelligence. But you know, back in the 80s, you could say, hey, there really has not been a lot of attention to this. Um, and in the intervening decades, most of the attention was on intelligence organizations, how they do analysis, when they're biased, whether they're politicized, like, you know, the weapons of mass destruction debacle, all these sorts of questions. Fewer questions about what kind of strategic interactions between states and other actors might look like. Um, but that has all changed radically in the last decade, right? We're kind of having this, this big intellectual renaissance in international relations. Um, and I think a lot of it is inspired by the secret statecraft activity that we are seeing in cyberspace, right? So we're seeing espionage, subversion, disinformation, counterintelligence, but at scale, right? Um, and not just state actors. So, right, you've got this wonderful quote by, you know, Josh Rovner saying, hey, we're looking at intelligence at scale, but our existing theories really don't tell us how to, to deal with it. But fortunately, Alison Carnegie reminds us, right, is that we actually are now starting to get some really fantastic studies about how covert action works, right, how intelligence works. Um, the conditions in which intelligence leads to dangerous escalation versus pacification and stability in international politics. So this is kind of a, a golden era of, of, of espionage studies. All right. Now, the study of deception and awareness of deception is hardly new in political philosophy. OK, um, you can go back to Machiavelli or further back to the Sun Tzu Bing Fa, Sun Tzu Art of War. OK, so there's Machiavelli saying, hey, if you're going to be a prince, right, you're probably going to have to lie to people now and again, right? It's really important to be crafty, to have strategy and stratagem, okay, um, that manipulates people um, uh, and populations when necessary. He's got this wonderful quote where he says, hey, the lion cannot defend himself against snares. The fox cannot defend himself against wolves. You need to be a fox to discover the snares and a lion to verify the wolves. And I love this menagerie here, right? He's got these three different kinds of animals, right? And he's highlighting, yeah, there are wolves out there, military forces, right, that will show up and invade your state, right? And you need, you know, similar wolves, military forces to attack and defend against those military predatory threats, right? And there are lions, okay? What is this animal? The lion is deterrence, right? I can make threats. I can threaten to release my wolves. I can threaten to sanction or to do other things, okay? But this is going to be overt threats, promises to do things. But there's this other beast, the fox. And the fox is neither wolf nor lion. It's not a lion because it's not roaring out in the open. It is working in the shadows. And it's not a wolf because it's not attacking and defending by kind of tooth and nail. It's using its craft. It's using its deceptive stratagems in order to get ahead. So three really different strategic logics. Okay, well, thinking about those animals, I think there's one other really important I animal. Whoops. Sorry, good afternoon, Erica. This is just is that a uh, clarifying question? Hot mic? Okay. I will press on if uh, if there's- Go ahead, John, I don't see any hands. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. 
Great. Um, okay, so we've got our foxes, wolves, and lions. Um, I think the other important animal that I want to bring into our menagerie at this point um, would be the stag. Okay, and this is a reference to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's famous kind of allegory of the stag hunt. And he tells a story about kind of a group of hunters and all of them need to cooperate and work together to take down the stag. Um, but these hunters are constantly tempted to, to bail on the hunting party and, and grab a hare, okay? So they'll eat not as well as they would eat if they bought a stag, but hey, you can get it right now. There's this temptation and all the other hunters are worried that those hunters will bail and grab the stag, grab the hare. And so, you know, it becomes really hard to do this. And of course the stag hunt, you know, very famous metaphor for collective action, right? Um, and, uh, you know, often we need to create institutions. We need to create governments in order to, you know, help people <laughs> contribute to public goods. But Rousseau's kind of next point in the discourse on inequality is once you create these governments for whatever reason, they tend to reflect the inequalities of their conditions and those very institutions, right, become elements of elements for um, for coercion, for deception, for misuse and abuse, right. So rather than wonderful public goods that help us to hunt stags together, right, um, we end up with you know institutions that risk being frivolous, deceitful, right, dishonorable without virtue reason without wisdom, pleasure without happiness. Um, and one of the reasons I put this quote up there is I think it is just such a wonderful description of kind of what cyberspace has become today, right? Pleasure without happiness, right? We're chasing dopamine on social media, but not really feeling like we're working together, right? Um, reason without wisdom, everybody's yelling at each other, right? But it's so hard to, to, to find, you know, sane voices uh, online. Uh, frivolousness, deception, right? So disinformation is flooding what um, once was hoped or thought to be kind of this wonderful domain of discourse and interaction, right? Kind of this new um, anarchy of reason, right? Instead has become very much like this uh, institutional world that Rousseau uh, describes. Okay, so let's fast forward once again, uh, and kind of the last, not a political philosopher, he is a political philosopher, but sort of would never ever describe himself that way, um, is Claude Shannon. And Claude Shannon um, is, you know, the guy who figured out that ones and zeros can represent mathematical functions, right? And then went on to invent information theory. And what I love about Claude Shannon's paper on information theory, it first comes out in 1948, is that there's an earlier paper that comes out in 1945. This one's classified. He's working at Bell Labs during the war um, on encrypted communications, right? Um, he has lunch with Alan Turing at one point, right? I mean, it's this like wonderful kind of collision of people thinking about computation and uh, information. And when you read his mathematical theory of cryptography, and you look at kind of what he's talking about, and then you go and read the mathematical theory of communication, you realize I'm reading exactly the same paper, okay? The mathematics of deception, i.e. hiding your signals in the noise, right? So that the eavesdropper cannot penetrate them, right? Or from the eavesdropper's perspective, like deceptively penetrating this kind of paradise of encrypted communication and then you know reading mail that you're not supposed to. The mathematics of deception is exactly the same as the mathematics of communication, right? The systems that are set up to enable us to communicate are also the systems that enable us to deceive for good or ill, right? There are good reasons to hide, to create privacy. There are also reasons to like, you know, hide threats. Okay. Um, so communication systems by their very nature, right? And we could discuss this, you know, in, in more depth, but but all we need to know is that like, when you create a communication system, you create the potential for deception. It is inherent in kind of technologically mediated interactions between people. Okay, um, so, right, what is the internet, right? It is an institution for communication at scale, right? Um, what you're looking at here, the details are not important. This is a diagram from a, David Clark, one of the kind of internet pioneers who wrote several versions of internet protocol. Um, and it, it describes all of kind of the consecutive miracles that have to happen for you to click on a link, right, and get the result, right? So when you go and kind of click on the globe of mail and you start reading the news, okay, you have to have 
this whole sequence of things in blue happen, the technical steps. And then he's got all of these wonderful little uh, ovals. And those ovals represent institutions that make sure that those steps are up and running. Okay. So, and the thing that we're doing every single day, there's this fantastically complex system of interdependencies that is not just technical, it is fundamentally socio technical, right? Um, and uh, this cooperative system of communication allows you to get things done. But of course, you just look at that and you're like, wow, if I was a hacker, here's lots of places I can hide, right? I can trick with the blue boxes and mess with the technology. I can maybe, you know, fish people who work in the red organization, or maybe I can get some insiders and, and turn them in through treachery, right? Start to you know, inject disinformation into your browsing experience or redirect you somewhere else or load something onto your computer, okay? So this fantastically complex system that allows communication, coordination, all the goodness of cyberspace, right, is also this, this wonderful potential engine for deception. Okay, so here's kind of the, the, the sort of historical, you know, Marshall McLuhan-esque you know, description of how we get from, you know, institutions, and I've got kind of John Locke. John Locke is much more positive than Rousseau, right? Rousseau is a very pessimistic fellow, um, but, you know, kind of his English counterpart, right? He is really, really, you know, hip onto uh, the goodness of governments, right? Especially when we voluntarily come together. This, of course, is our kind of North American political heritage, right? Voluntary creation of public infrastructures and institutions will leave people better off because we can have more property and exchange it and create all these wonderful goods, right? But now we have enabled us to go back to the future. And here's old Sunza from 2,500 years ago in China, informing us that there are these five different kinds of spies, low-level spies, high-level targeted spies, double spies, um, active operations, blown operations, all kinds of things, right, that you would recognize in the Philby case and the Solar Winds case. Sunza thought about it, but now we're able to do it at scale because of these political institutions, right, that John Locke has helped us to think through and, and put together. Okay. Now, this story of supersizing cooperation and enabling new forms of political interaction, right? There are echoes in kind of very recent, you know, intellectual traditions and thinking about the discipline of international relations, right? So we always had war and we had fellows like Karl von Clausewitz who thought about war, right? An act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. I don't need your cooperation. I'm going to take your things by force, occupy your territory, right? I am going to use like tooth and nail. This is the wolf, okay? But when you supersize the wolf, when you have the possibility for absolute destruction, something very weird happens, right? War becomes too expensive, becomes too dangerous. And we find ourselves in the middle of the 20th century having to think really, really seriously about deterrence, right? This is weird, right? So now we've got like the ability to go to extremes and the wolf then brings in the lion. And now lions have always existed, but we have to start having systematic theories, lion theory, right? This is deterrence. Like we need to have systematic theories about how to manage the threat of absolute violence, okay? So deception has always been with us, but the supersizing of cooperation is making it very important for us to figure out how deception and intelligence works. Deterrence was always with us, but supersizing violence made it really, really important to figure out how coercive bargaining worked. Okay. So these are, and this is kind of a core theoretical framework of the book, right? Is thinking about these four basic strategic logics that have always been with us, okay? The logic of coordination, John Locke, world of liberalism and peace, we understand that, right? Creating common institutions for the common good, right? Improving cooperation through, you know, organized governments, that's good, right? We've always had Karl von Clausewitz right there. All right, we're in an anarchic world. We all have our own military forces. This is a world of self-help. This is a very dangerous world of conflict. And so you need to be ready to fight tooth and nail to get what you want. 
Um, there's these other two logics, which are interesting, right? So Thomas Schelling, we kind of just talked about deterrence, right? It's all about, I've now got the ability to do things. I've now got an exit option, but I want to use it to compel cooperation, right? Deterrence theorists are kind of really, really into this paradox that like you're creating cooperation by threatening conflict and all of the problems with credibility kind of come from this same paradox. Um, and I'd like to argue that there's this missing category, the category of Sunza. It's always been there, okay? But we haven't been paying enough attention to the ways in which cooperative common institutions enable new forms of conflict. So um, kind of highlight the other uh, philosophers that we had on there. Um, you know, uh, uh, Rousseau is a much more pessimistic fellow than Locke, right? He wants to point out that like deception and corruption is sort of an inevitable aspect of, of, of creating these institutions. And then of course there's Machiavelli down there and he's talking about kind of our, our three different forms of conflict, right? Fox, wolves, lions, and stags, right? These are kind of four super, super basic kind of strategic logics of international relations. They show up all over the place. The names change, the logics are the same, okay? So when you scale them up, right? When you supersize coordination, right? You get lots and lots of deception. Just like when you supersize your independent capability for violence, right? You get the necessity for deterrence, okay? So scaling up things starts to kind of move us around this box. And of course there tends to be this kind of autocatalytic cycle, right? If you are bargaining well, you're making threats and making assurances, the outcome is a stable bargaining, a deal, an institution, an arms control agreement, a new government, right? It's kind of Charles Tilley, right? He's kind of brings us out of the world of coercion into the world of states, okay? So, so we can go from influence, coercion to governments. Governments lead us to deception, thank you Rousseau, right? And deception, also Sunza, right? Can be useful in war, right? And the modern way of war, right? Is all about intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, trying to do things on the cheap by using you know, surprise, stratagem, uh, precision targeting, okay? Using intelligence to complement the military instrument. Um, and then we wonder, right, can these new military instruments still be useful for integrated deterrence? Um, can the Chinese build an informatized military that will be able to uh, deter the United States, okay? Um, uh, these are all kind of questions of, of, of current national security uh, policy. But again, we've got this sort of basic, this basic cycle that has always been with us at different scales and in different issue areas, moving us through these, uh, these four basic strategic logics. Okay, um, so this is sort of just coming attractions. We're not gonna go into any of this right now unless somebody really wants to ask me questions in the Q and A. Um, I've just been trying to kind of lay out the general framework of thinking about sort of this paradoxical logic of deception, but um, the book spends a lot of time kind of going through a couple of really, really interesting historical cases um, that exemplify not only these individual strategic logics, but importantly, this is what I'm really interested in, are kind of the tensions, the movements, the interactions across all of these. Okay, um, so I look at the kind of emergence of cyberspace and internet security. Right? Defense is largely a problem of kind of coordinating efforts for the common good, right? Um, I look at Bletchley Park, and Bletchley Park is such a wonderful case for many, many reasons, right? Super famous as kind of an intelligence success story. Uh, less appreciated is kind of the dawn of computing, right? Alan Turing is working there. They invent this machine picture there. It's called Colossus. It's the world's first electronic machine with um, electronic valves, i.e. vacuum tubes. Um, uh, and it's working on code breaking, okay? So you've got this kind of practical state organized deceptive code breaking effort, um, you know, that is kind of giving rise to cyber. Um, and it's a wonderful case because the reasons that Bletchley Park was successful, right, continue to resonate today, right? You can kind of look at, at, at signal cyber cases and, 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 and figure out like, okay, like were the conditions for deceptions met or not? Um, I look at Stuxnet down there, right? Um, 
If um, you've been in the cave somewhere in the last 10 years and you haven't heard of Stuxnet, this was a joint U.S.-Israeli effort to try and um, slow down the uh, uh, Iranian nuclear program. And it did it by infiltrating the industrial control systems that spin around uh, centrifuges. And centrifuges help you to enrich uranium. And if you enrich a lot of uranium, you can eventually get a bomb, okay? Um, and um, this is a great case. I put it in the warfare case because it's actually not a case of war. This is what's so much fun is that this is actually a case of covert action. It kind of belongs up in that deception box. But, you know, it is sort of the signal case that helps people think about cyber war. My argument is, well, we've been thinking about this all wrong. This thing that you think that's down in that box of warfare is actually kind of a classic case of covert action, not warfare at all. OK, it's a very complex set of interactions between Iran, Israel, the United States, several other states and uh, besides. Um, and it's not purely you know, uh, um, conflicting as well. Right. Uh, you get the United States. Right. Yes. Trying to slow down the Iranian production of uranium, but also trying to restrain Israel. Right. Um, trying to dissuade Israel from launching an airstrike, which would be kind of a political disaster at that time. So you're using secret statecraft, not just competitively against an actor, but also to try and restrain a partner who has divergent interests from yours. Right. The failure of Stuxnet leads to the talks that are in secret between the United States and Iran that then blossom into the kind of nuclear negotiations. So so secret statecraft is, is complex, full of paradox um, and, and really, really uh, exemplified in this case. And then finally, um, you know, I look uh, kind of in depth at the 2016 election case um, and just a kind of a few quick words on that. Right. I kind of put disinformation down in the influence case and maybe. Kind of, if you remember, I had sort of Thomas Schelling as my 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 signal philosopher there. And you're like, well, Schelling was talking about nuclear war. What the heck does he have to do with disinformation? Um, and the answer is this, right? Schelling helped us to think very clearly about what credible, persuasive communication looks like. And we have to ask ourselves: Is disinformation effective because it is a costly, credible signal? And that's kind of a weird question, right? Because like the whole point about Russian disinformation is it's easy to make, it's easy to get out there. There's lots and lots of stuff. This is the very definition of cheap talk. It should not work from a shelling s point of view, okay? And of course the answer is, well, that's not how it worked at all, right? Um, to the extent that Russian disinformation mattered in 2016, it's because there was immense demand for it in the American electorate, right? All you have to do is look at 2020, where there is no Russian disinformation campaign, or it's very small, it's very controlled, and yet disinformation is running wild, right, culminating in the Capitol riot, okay? So disinformation is really fundamentally a demand-driven problem, and it's a demand-driven problem that works through another important shelling mechanism of separation and tipping point, okay? So if you can tell who's on your team, who's willing to repeat the big lie and who's willing to fact check it, you now have a really reliable signal of who's on your team and who is a political adversary, okay? So while this information does not work as a costly signal at the international level, it's fantastic as a costly signal for political sorting into factions. If we look at disinformation as a demand-driven political problem rather than a technologically driven, uh, uh, rather than a supply-driven technology problem. Okay, and then I kind of bring all this together and thinking about China, who kind of has, you know, all of these different things going on at the same time. Um, and it's really a mixed bag for China, like it's good in some ways, and it's really bad in some ways, right? And why is that, right? Well, we're dealing with fundamental contradictions between working in shared institutions and independent institutions, trying to cooperate and compete at the same time. Okay, so all of the political conundrums around China right, are sort of tied together in sort of these fundamental contradictions that come from having to work across different strategic logics. Okay, so I've thrown a bunch of stuff out there. Um, like I said, these are really just sort of coming attractions of sort of the more kind of historical empirical case studies that I'm going to use to kind of work through these, these dynamic logics um, in, in practice. Okay, um, so let me kind of, you know, uh, 
close or nearly close with, you know, going back to well, what does this mean for sort of the evolution of international relations and conflict? Okay, so um, here on this graph, right, you can kind of think on the y-axis is the scale of technological innovation, right? Humans make some very big things, right? We make railroads, we make uh, space satellites, right? We're leaving the planetary system and going into interplanetary, maybe you know, interstellar space as well. So you can do things very, very big, right? And then we can also engineer the very small, okay? So the whole reason that, you know, SRI exists is thinking about kind of the revolution in compute and data, which has like made AI feasible. And now we're having to like, you know, think through all the implications. So we can have um, innovations at the very large, innovations at the, the very small. So sort of kind of our technological access. And then here's how um, conflict is evolving over time. Like I'm, I'm a political scientist, complex scholar. So that's kind of what I'm going to focus on here. Okay. Um, so, you know, as humanity innovates, right, first all you can do is sort of sail around and ride on your horse. That's kind of the limit of how fast you can get very far. You invent railroads, we invent steamships, right now we've got airplanes. Okay, so we're kind of constantly increasing the upper bound on what kind of violence is possible, right? If you want to have a lot of violence at scale and a lot of it, all right, um, that's been steadily increasing, but it also kind of tapers off. Okay, um, right now, like we've kind of maxed out with being able to nuke the entire planet. Okay, maybe someday we'll be able to nuke other planets as well, but we're not there yet. Okay, so we've kind of got this sort of tapering off on um, uh, uh, the upper bound of potential violence. Okay, um, now the upper bound of potential violence is not actually map onto historical patterns. Right, throughout most of history, like there were many cases of political parties trying to push the envelope, right? And mobilize as much power as they possibly could and go all the way, right? And this sort of like culminates with kind of the big wars of the Industrial Revolution, right? Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, right? They're all kind of of a piece, okay? Where you are mobilizing unprecedented capacity for violence at speed and at scale, okay? But then a funny thing happens, right? Um, in the nuclear revolution, it's we start to see war diminish, right? We start to see restraints. We see actors that have the capacity to go to the limit, but they stop going to the limit. War does not stop because of nuclear weapons, right? Absolutely not. But war transforms, right? You see restrained wars. You see more conventional wars where actors are pulling their punches. We see proxy wars, covert wars right? Uh, intelligence contests, right? So there's a lot of things that are going on and we're seeing this to the day, right? Um, we could talk about Ukraine if you want to. It's a wonderful case, um, but it is like it's kind of a wonderful exception that proves the rule. You can look at it and say like, man, that's a pretty big war, right? Biggest land war that we've seen uh, in Europe since World War II. And that it is, but that war could be so much bigger than it is. And part of the reason why it's not big is it there is agreement on all sides to keep it contained, right? And NATO and the United States have been very, very clear that this war stops at the NATO border, right? And Russia has been very clear that this war stops at the Russian border. That one's been a little more porous, right? There's been kind of cross-border activity, super, <laughs> super covert. No one's really quite owning um, what's happening. But nuclear weapons are very much in play in this war in Ukraine to kind of keep it contained, okay? Um, at the same time, right, while we've been kind of innovating in the very big, right, we've also, of course, been innovating in the very small. We've had kind of this ongoing information revolution, right? Um, and we haven't quite found the bottom of it yet, right? This is kind of a quantum inf informatics you know, revolution. Maybe we'll get there. It'll taper off uh, at some point, okay? Um, but there's lots of potential for command, control, communication, coordination. That, of course, has been a part of you know, supersizing violence as well. If you can't coordinate your armies, you can't, you know, use them. Um, but, you know, like the information revolution has gone hand in hand with revolutions in governance, in management. Governments and big corporations are always the early adopters of information technologies, okay? Um, so we've kind of got this interesting situation where the technology that has enabled kind of large-scale institutions for governance and management, right, 
are also, you know, uh, uh, enabling um, whole new forms of espionage and subversion. So kind of here's the best of times and worst of times. You're like, good news, right? Steven Pinker, although there's problems with that argument, but like, okay, let's just sort of buy his general argument that like, there is a lessening of the violence, right? We are having less large scale interstate destructive warfare than before, yay humanity, okay? But the price of peace, or at least negative peace, the absence of war, is more secret statecraft, is more deception, more subversion, more espionage, okay? So we're pushing down the vertical severity of conflict. And as a result, you have this kind of horizontal spread of its sophistication and uh, uh, variety. All right. So um, let's go ahead and wrap this up because I do want to get to uh, um, uh, questions, right? Um, I think when we think about cyber conflict, it is not, not war, right? That is totally the wrong frame. It's intelligence. I like to call it secret statecraft because the world, world of intelligence is confusing for many reasons. Covert action is a part of intelligence. Counterintelligence is a part of intelligence. So I'll just call it secret statecraft, right? The use of organized deception for strategic ends, okay? And it's interesting because it fundamentally involves the use of cooperative means for conflicting ends, right? And so intelligence is just taking this classic strategic logic and supersizing it, okay? Um, performance is super contingent on institutional context. Um, I'm not going to go into this um, very much, um, but what this slide is basically saying, let me just translate it, forget about the words. It says that if you're going to do well in intelligence, you're going to be Kim Philby or Solar Winds, both of which were good until they weren't, right? Both of them were great operations until they were compromised, right? You need to meet conditions in all four of these areas, right? You need to have coordination, which gives me access. I need to have deception, which depends on the cooperation of the victim. I need to have organized capacities from the logic of warfare in order to run my intelligence operation. And I need to keep the whole thing secret, which means I am deterred by the other side from releasing things. So if I'm going to be successful in this world of secret statecraft, I need to be playing in all four of these logics at the same time, which means I'm dealing with some inherent contradictions. This is why intelligence is so, so hard to get right. Okay, um, what the hell does this mean? Kind of what are the policy implications? Um, I think at a very, very gross level, we can think like, okay, well, there are three ways to improve cybersecurity. One is get rid of all of the systems that enable deception, right? No common institutions, no common internet, no deception, all right? Well, that is a world of total warfare, okay? We have gotten rid of the conditions for coordination and cooperation, Yay, no cyber conflict, but you're probably in a world that you don't want to live in, right? The other option, this kind of China's going down this path, is, all right, let's impose absolute cooperation. Remember, deception is common institution, but conflict. So if you can maybe have such robust counterintelligence and other coercive tools that allows you to tamp that down, right, then you can have the totalitarian peace, okay? Absolute cooperation gives you, right? a lack of deception. Probably don't want this, so we're stuck now in these other two boxes where we're gonna kind of haltingly muddle our way through to improve liberal order, to improve coordination, to come up with better institutions that can accommodate these things, accepting that deception, subversion, disinformation is going to be the price. And that's not always a bad thing because it also gives us the ability to understand where we're breaking. It helps us to identify the things that we need to fix, okay? So this kind of liberal muddling through does not get us to Kantian perpetual peace. It gets us to a world of kind of ongoing intelligence conflicts, um, but maybe that's better than the alternative. So I think I will pause there and uh, I think it gives us an hour to discuss. Thanks very much, John. Uh, very, very much. I've got a question here, a chance for questions. Uh, if people want to uh, put their hands up. Um, I've got Morgan first. Morgan. Yeah, hi. Um, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when I think about deception, there's uh, there's at least two elements to that, um, to gaining an information advantage. And one of those is keeping secrets um, and preventing your rivals from 
finding out information about you, and the other is the mirror inverse, finding out information about your rivals. Um, so when we say that deception is being done at scale, uh, have these scaled symmetrically, or is it fair to say uh, the one has scaled faster than the other? And does that matter? Uh, not simply that there's more deception, but if it, it's a, a different quality of deception. Yeah, yeah, that that is a that is a super question. Um, not exactly where I thought you were going with it, but I'm glad you went that direction. I thought you were gonna call me out on the definition of deception, which many people do. And deception, intelligence, all these words are super fraught, given that like both of them are about like undermining boundaries and dealing with ambiguities. Like <laughs> we just have to accept that definitions are gonna be problematic. But um, but yes, I agree with you, right? So so deception has this offensive and defensive valence, right? And the offensive side is I'm going to put a secret information channel into your organization and I'm either going to use it to inject information in, disruption, manipulation, disinformation, covert action, or I'm going to use it to exfiltrate information out, right? Cybercrime, espionage, intelligence collection, you know, what have you. So kind of the core competency on the offensive operational side of intelligence organization is creating that secret information channel. Which direction it runs, right? Well, that's that's a policy choice that depends on your objectives, but that's what you're gonna do. Now, of course, you defensively wanna keep the adversary from doing that. And interesting fact about intelligence, right, is that in order to do offense, you have to play defense, right? If you're trying to create this channel to suck information out or to inject instructions in, you wanna keep that activity secret, okay? so. If you are doing offense, you are playing defense. And I think that really complicates the answer to your question, right? What's getting better, offense or defense? Well, if I answer offense is getting better, right? Then I also need to say, well, defense is also good too because offense is getting better because I can have more secret channels that I can maintain you know, and keep place. If I say that defense is getting better, that means that I have made it difficult to create those secret channels to inject information, you know, uh, one way or the other. Um, so, so I think that that's, you know, that points to kind of a difference in the world of intelligence that is not exactly mirrored in the military world. Military, it's a little easier. It's not easy to separate kind of attack and defense. But in the intelligence world, like they're really, really together, right? Offensive intelligence operations always have to have operational security tradecraft in order to protect them. Uh, now, if you think that that answer is too weaselly, um, which is fine, um, I think my next answer would be, um, well, it depends, right? Part of the argument that I'm trying to make is that every intelligence slash deception operation is so dependent on local, political, organizational, strategic context that you're going to have to look very carefully to see how these four different conditions are met. Okay. Um, so while there are kind of systemic trends in the amount and type of conflict that we have, um, I do not expect to see kind of systematic changes that are advantaging the offense or the defense. Now, the only place that I may back off from that a little bit is when you kind of go back to remember I had that, that picture of like, here's a lot of a little, a little of a lot, okay? Um, I think that offense tends to be easier at low intensity, right? So when you're going after targets that are not as important because they're really, really hard to monetize and they don't actually hurt the target very much, offense is easy, right? Well, because the other side's not bothering to defend them. If you're doing Stuxnet, okay, and you're or you're wanting to take down nuclear command and control, you better be really, really good. And offense gets extremely difficult because your intelligence has to be perfect and your targeting has to be precise. And you have to not get found out because there's all kinds of like terrible adverse consequences. So at that kind of intensity scale, right, it flips. And now offense becomes really, really difficult because defense really, really cares, okay? And defense is working hard, right? So to kind of say that like, well, the offense-defense balance depends on scale 
There's another way of saying, well, the offense defense balance doesn't actually depend on technology at all. It depends on, once again, context, right? The context and political stakes of the targets that you're thinking about. Right. Thank you. And it's great to see you again, Morgan. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks, John. David Lee. Um, hi, John. Great talk. Uh, I, I, I just had a question about um, how, how you were comparing the, um, the I guess, the espionage to the Philby case. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess one, one difference that I feel may be important is that uh, I guess cybersecurity here spans a lot of private institutions. So exactly with SolarWinds, SolarWinds was built by a private company. They 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 operated according to their own rules. Um, and sure, uh, you know, when they make a contract with the US DOD, the, the DOD can impose certain rules on how they operate. But usually those are very like compared to, you know, someone who's operating it's actually inside the government. So how do nations kind of uh, that have private enterprises, which is most of them, I guess. Yeah. How do they enforce this kind of national security when they rely uh, a lot on private contractors and not just in the military space? I'm talking about infrastructure, communications, um, all sorts of things like the fabric of society. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for that question, David. Um, I think there were two questions in there. The first was kind of compare and contrast espionage then and now. And the second was, how do we think about kind of the public private interface um, in cybersecurity? Um, and on that first piece, um, you know, while I was talking it through, I was definitely kind of talking about the similarities. And, you know, the similarities are in all four of those boxes, right? Both of them had um, common cultures and infrastructures that gave them access. Both of them had really cooperative targets that willingly but unwittingly opened up vulnerabilities. Both of them relied on organizational infrastructure to manage the intrusion. And both of them had, you know, attention to their operational security tradecraft. So in all four of those boxes, similarities across time. Um, but the headline of that slide was, you know, intelligence now digitized, supersized, and civilianized. And those are the three things that are different. And they're different in a big way, right? I mean, like, like human intelligence and standoff technical intelligence are really, really different specialties, different specialists, different kind of political risks that are attached to them. So the technical tradecraft is really, really different um, and it takes different kinds of organizations to do it. Um, it's happening at scale, right? like, like you mentioned, right? Um, part of the reason we're so worried about this is that like, oh my God, like <laughs> the the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, Department of Treasury, um, Department of Energy, State Department, like all of these major government agencies, like we're contracting to solar winds to keep their systems patched and secure. And that was the vector through which they're you know, hit. So you're like, wow, that's that's a that's a big scale, right? Like, like Philby couldn't do that. Um, you know, I mean, Philby undermined not just MI6, but the CIA, right? I mean. Ukrainian operations fail, Albanian operations fail. Like so, like he gets some leverage, but nothing like like this. Um, and then there's that that you know ultimately this is about civilian interactions, right? And and it's interesting. It's not just that Solar Winds is a civilian company, and because it's contracted with government, you've got this liability and exposure, right? It is outed by FireEye, and FireEye for all intents and purposes, is a counterintelligence organization, right? You know, and the, you know, APT-29, like, threat actor, like, what they stole were FireEye's red teaming tools. I love this. Like, it's an intelligence organization running a counterintelligence operation against a private counterintelligence company to steal the tools that they use to try and penetrate their customers, right? I mean, like, it is the classic hall of mirrors from, from spy literature. So, um, so, Yes, like I think there are these enduring similarities, but the scale effects on all three of these are really, really different. Um, and it's the potential, probably the fourth one that should have been on the headline would be weaponization, right? Like this fear that that you're going to weaponize access through all these civilian organizations at scale to then get get disruption. Um, and that's what people kind of freaked out about um, solar winds, um, even though there's zero evidence that this was anything other than an espionage operation. Okay, um, so well, what do you do? And I think the answer is like, well, it remains a really, really hard problem. There's not an easy solution to it. And it's hard because you're interacting through a political economic system, right? 
that's got a mixed market of public private actors that have incentives to do things and the markets are failing in weird ways and governments are failing in weird ways and there's incentives to hoard your information and incentives to go to private industry because they can do it more efficiently but now you can't control them right um so this is this is an issue and i could talk forever about information sharing and how you could fix you know, you can't fix it, but how you may, maybe can marginally improve cybersecurity. But I think that the thing is, is that all of those super hyper complex mixed market constellation of market failures and government failures, like provide the raw material for intelligence operations at scale. So while you've always relied on front companies and civilian personas to do your government operations, now, like the combinatorial possibilities are just much, much larger, which makes the public policy problems that much more wicked. Um, and then the only silver lining is maybe the severity is not as extreme. So super cold comfort for, for policy folks uh, dealing in this space. Thanks very much, John. I think we have a question in the room at, uh, at SRI. Hey there, thanks, John. That was great, uh, especially since these are not my areas of expertise. And it, it was um, wonderful to see that all in context with uh, John Locke and uh, Thomas Schelling and, and others there. I have an, a, a question about, so you mentioned at the very beginning. So when you mentioned espionage, um, and sort of historically, Kim told me that's about state secrets. Um, and yet we've, we've moved into the world where there seems to be that the public apparatus around cybersecurity is also focusing on, theft, focusing on theft of trade secrets. So private information, you know, private technology. And I'm wondering, is that, is that creep? I mean, I, I, I saw sort of a headline recently with, you know, concerns about collaborations between researchers in Canada and researchers in, let's say, China. Um, and concerns about cybersecurity attacks or theft, theft of, of technology and trade secrets. And I, I find myself, well, wait a second, why, why is that part of the intelligence apparatus? Why, why is the Canadian Security Agency focusing on that? I'm not saying it's not an issue, but can, can you help me sort of just understand sort of moving from the world where we're talking about theft of, of state secrets to theft of private trade secrets, which is, of course, also, I mean, and that we protect that for economic reasons. Uh, we don't protect that for uh, national security reasons. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That, that, that is a great question and so many different faucets to pull out on that. Um, you know, there is a national security angle on that, right? So insofar as you believe that, you know, your economic productivity feeds into your military power, um, both because it produces dollars to buy weapons and it produces, you know, technologies to use on the battlefield, uh, protecting your industry, right, you know, is important there. Um, but the other thing is that, like, it's, you know, certainly in the Chinese case, which is kind of, you know, what people focus on mainly when they focus on, like, cyber industrial espionage, right? Nation state level, you know, military, KGB, MSS type organizations, right, that are hitting the private sector, okay? Um, and they're doing it, yes, for economic reasons, but the motivation on the Chinese side is fundamentally political. Okay, if the Chinese Communist Party is going to stay in power, the social contract they have with the Chinese people is we will make you rich and you will tolerate the emperor. Okay, and so in order to do that, we're going to go out and steal the stuff because that's the faster way to get from here to there. Right. And so we'll do industrial espionage and the same organization will hit political organizations, military organizations, defense contractors, international institutions. Okay, so it's sort of a full court press that's driven by this imperative for economic growth and military modernization to serve the bolstering the legitimacy and control of the Chinese Communist Party, okay? So I think that because we're living in this world where you have, you know, unprecedented global economic interdependence, right? The triumph of the global liberal order creates this set of interactions that absolutely blur the line between 
economic espionage and national security work, between war and peace, between state level activity and commercial activity, which is why you have, you know, it's not just kind of a bunch of corporations that are like, oh, woe is me, I'm getting hammered by nation state level threats. We're also getting hit by non-state kind of ransomware threats, but you have the rise of the cybersecurity industry, right? The Mandiants, the the um, ESETs, the crowd strikes, right? Um, and these organizations either are ex-intelligence officers, right? Or they are actively reinventing intelligence tradecraft, right? So you've kind of got this really interesting world where the traditional world of intelligence tradecraft is now has this much wider aperture to go after trade secrets and undermine civil society and all of that stuff, as well as the parallel rise of a privatized intelligence and counterintelligence uh, sector to to deal with a lot of that. So so that's that's kind of the essence of the the supersizing and civilianizing um, that was talked about. Um, and, and one last thing, um, actually, was the first thing I thought about when you're asking that question, right? Um, the kind of focus on on nation state commercial espionage is totally not new. There's this wonderful history of like you know, continental industrial espionage and focuses on like the English textile industry, which was really awesome in the 18th century. And the French are like, we want some of that. Okay, let's go get, you know, your things. So they're like, okay, let's let's get textile machinery. Let's get the plans. And they had trouble building it, right? And they couldn't like quite figure out what the plans really meant and how it went together because it was all embodied in know-how. So they're like, okay, uh, let's go get the machines. So like they brought the machines over, kind of smuggled them across, no permit to do so. And like, we've got the machines, but we can't get them working, right? Apparently there's embodied know-how and labor as well. We don't have that. Okay, well, let's go back and we'll get some English workers over there to run our new like textile plant. And like, it still doesn't work because the only Englishmen that were willing to leave were like totally drunk and derelict and like they weren't the workers you wanted anyway. Um, so like, there's this whole back end on making it work. And it's hilarious because like China is totally dealing with like they, stealing like petabytes worth of intellectual property, but like translating that into workable production is a super hard process. And so like, there's just all these examples where you know, the Chinese can't get jet engines work, even though they've stolen everything they need and the Russians help them to build this plant and you still can't like get it to work. So, you know, I mean, those, those themes are timeless. John, I was hoping I could get into the, to the queue here. Um, yeah. And I, I just, because you all know my own interest here, I, I wonder if you could talk about this from the perspective of people who consume intelligence at the highest level, that is to say, yeah, yeah. politicians. Um, so, you know, I think there is, all of us sort of have a vision of, of what normal intelligence or espionage is and what it's teaching us, right? It's giving us information about elite views and maybe even we're looking inside the mind of a leader about, about um, uh, what they think about some issue and then what they'll be doing. And it really becomes, when you, when you characterize it, it becomes, intelligence about the beliefs of a small number of people or maybe the actions that they're going to take etc cetera, etc cetera, right whereas what you're describing in, in some parts of it is a form of intelligence that allows us to learn things at scale and at scale means i guess you know much more depth among this the certain people we would normally be interested in but also a much wider breadth of views and beliefs and actions that people are that people are taking right so uh if we want to kind of stylize this at one point you know a leader is told about um, 50 years ago was told about a briefing or a cable that's been intercepted about one thing that a government is planning on doing one troop movement or or one financial transaction or something which is meant to be indicative of something and now they're given reams and reams and reams of data about hundreds of things happening at once and those might be summarized in some sort of way but it's really not only data of a different kind but data of a, of a huge of a, of a massively different scale right Humans aren't very good at thinking about things in scale. We like to have stories. We like to think about individual actors. But just talk about, I mean, this is, can you just reflect on what, what the difference is for people who are consumers of intelligence when we start dealing with intelligence that is just at a, not only at a different scale, but one in which it's hard for people to put narrative onto? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I think in many ways, this goes back to Morgan's beginning question about, you know, does this advantage offense or defense. And this also related to the kind of little parable I just told about textiles as well, right? So, you know, does the information revolution um, enable you to collect 
more intelligence about more things? Um, yes, absolutely, right? You can now collect all the things about all the stuff, okay? Um, does that make our policymakers um, smarter? Well, not really, right? You've got information overload, you're having to make sense of it. You know, a lot of what you're collecting is absolute junk, okay? So um, you don't just have access to more needles, you're also sucking in more hay. And so the haystacks are bigger. Um, and so now you're having to invest in larger organizations to sift through all that. And when you invest in larger organizations, you create more entrenched interests and kind of political relationships, right? I mean, the United States is now up to 18 different intelligence agencies, right? We used to have just 17, and then we created Space Force. And so now there's also a space intelligence agency that has been like added into the mix, okay? So more sources of intelligence about more things for more customers, right? The problem is getting really, really hard. So if it was just a simple matter of we made cyberspace and now information is cheap, you would just expect there to be more useful stuff. But what you've seen is like the cost of the intelligence community in every kind of country that's kind of really playing seriously in intelligence business has gone up. It's huge, right? I mean, like intelligence is just really, really expensive. And most of that expenditure is not on collection. It's all on processing analysis and dissemination, okay? It's all on the back end. It's all on dealing with you know exactly the problems that, that you're talking about. So, you know, I think these classic problems of kind of intelligence policy relations, right, are just becoming way, way more intense because of the scale possibilities. And you're, I mean, you're right, like, you know, think of classic intelligence success stories, the, the Zimmerman telegram, right, that like gets the United States in into the war because, you know, we find out that, you know, the Germans are trying to bring the, the Mexicans in on their side, right? Um, you know, that's one telegram, which then creates this wonderful narrative for Wilson to tell the, the narrative that he wants to tell, okay? Um, and the British have this really cool, like, covert action they have to do because they can't tell the Americans that they've penetrated the diplomatic cables in order to get it, right? It's a, it's a lovely case. But then you, like, fast forward to my case of Bletchley Park, right? And that, that's this sea change in state intelligence, where, like, Bletchley Park is the kind of the first organization that I know about where they're, like, we're not just looking for Zimmerman telegrams, right? Every other code breaker in the world was like, I'm going to find that really incriminating communication from Mary Queen of Scots. And like, I'm going to break this and that's going to give me the goods, right? And I'll take that to, you know, Queen Elizabeth and then she'll be able to like sign the death warrant, okay? Um, that's kind of what intelligence was. And 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 Bletchley Clark was like, nope, we're going to do the NSA thing. We're going to collect all the things because we're going after the system. We're going to break the other side's crypto systems. We're going to break their communication systems. So no matter how trivial it is, it can be about weather reports or like people pining about their girlfriends, you know, back home, whatever it is, like that's going to get us into the system. And once we do that, right, holy shit, we're going to have to like pay all these people to really know Germany and know how it works and figure out like, what we should be collecting and where and where we're targeting, right? So you've now created this massive bureaucratic problem. That's why I love Bletchley Park because it is the inflection point to exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, I think that like we have supersized not just the opportunities for intelligence, but also, right, these very, very real difficulties of presenting the information, of assessing the information, of dealing with the politicization of information, of releasing it, right? This is, this is a whole new theme in intelligence studies is like, releasing information that was secret in order to manipulate the world for good or bad. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully it talks to you a bit. No, it does. I mean, the, the Bletchley Park example is an interesting one because it's, I mean, that's partially about trying to get all the data so you can have all the data, but it's also recognizing that if you get everything, then you can break their systems of communication. So there's two goals there, right? To, just to, to impair their, their ability to signal to each other, but also to try to have some, you know, like leverage at a massive scale over over what yeah. they're over what they're uh, over what they're doing, right? I mean, the the, the summary point here in the in, in the end for me is kind of that there's a question about at which point you kind of reach saturation in terms of the amount of data that's useful for you to make strategic decisions, and we're surely there, right? So the so the the 
the game now is in trying to figure out the predictive model or however you want to characterize it, think about Abby here, however you want to characterize it in a way that you're actually getting leverage over outcomes that you care about with all the data that you've got, right? And and that's yeah. that's a different order of problem than than simply the acquisition of information. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, you know, there there still might be, you know, this key piece of data that you need, but in order to get it, like you have this amazing sifting problem uh, that you want to go through. You know, um, Intel folks like to talk about this distinction between, um, you know, secrets and mysteries and secrets are just huh. facts that you don't know, like weapons characteristics, like what the Chinese are doing with their modernization problem. Yes. And like mysteries are like, how much does Putin care about Ukraine? Like, where yeah. is he willing to use nuclear weapons? And like, right. Putin probably doesn't even know the answer to that one. Right. And, right. you know, like, as we're, we have access to more information, I think like these mysteries, like it's tempting, we're closer to them, but they're just as mysterious as they've always been. Yes, yes. Morgan. Yeah, I, I've noticed this sort of contradiction between this uh, conventional narrative that we hear that the cyber domain levels um, differences in capabilities between traditionally powerful actors like the large states yeah. and those less powerful actors like private enterprise now getting in on the espionage game. But then on the other hand, we see this development, which you just alluded to, where in conditions of information abundance, there's this huge organizational cost uh, to sift through the dross. But yeah. would that not point to you know, a problem of scale that would advantage those larger actors and those more conventionally capable actors? Yeah, yes. Okay, so in that respect, right. Is that technological scale? Is that political scale? Okay, I see where you're going with that now. And, and, I, and I do agree with that, right? I mean, I think part of why you don't see cyber war, and by that I mean like targeted catastrophic destruction of critical infrastructure for political costs, like first of all, it's really hard to do. And second of all, there's few actors that would benefit from it and are willing to like run the risks of, you know, all this stuff. And that tends to be bigger actors, right? With sophisticated intelligence organizations with like big planning capabilities and lots of experience doing this. Oh, and by the way, like backstopped by, you know, the full kind of military might of, of a great power, right? In case things go wrong. Right? So, so yeah, I think that scale in that sense certainly makes it possible to overcome some of these barriers. Um, but again, complicated. Um, yeah. Fair enough. But right, I mean, like, like, like that kind of scale has always really, really been important. I think, like, there's always, you know, there's this constant tension in information studies, information society studies between like, hey, this empowers everybody. The costs are falling to like, oh my gosh, like it is, you know, a victory for totalitarian government. And like, it's both in different ways and at different times. And getting the conditions right, I think, is. You know, that's where dissertations like yours hopefully will really help to teach us a lot. We have time for one last question, but if, uh, and I'll give it a second here. We're just, we're just up against the, the crest of the time, John. Okay, uh, what I'll do then, John, is I'll give you back two minutes um, uh, um, and just say thanks very, very much for joining us for a, for a talk, which I think is pretty characteristic of your, of your work. It combines actual technical knowledge, which many, IR scholars actually lack with uh, with a deep engagement, not only with political and uh, diplomatic history, but also political theory. So this is really all had all the hallmarks of uh, what one expects when John Lindsay gives us his time. So on behalf of everyone here, John and Schwartz Reisman uh, Institute, it's really my pleasure to thank you for joining us and ask everyone to join me in giving John a very appreciative uh, round of applause.